Hey everybody and welcome back to another interview episode of the 10 Minute Jazz Lesson Podcast. Really excited about releasing this interview to you this week. Uh, we are welcoming onto the show Nick Finzer, who is a fantastic trombone player and runs the record label Outside in Music. But before we get into the show today, just wanted to give a quick shout out to our sponsor, Rejuvenate. All you read players out there, I know you're looking for a way to take better care of your reads. I know that you're looking for a way to your reads for your reads to play better straight out of the case, and Rejuvenate is it. I absolutely love these guys. Uh, they're really, really big supporters of the podcast, and they're just making an awesome product that will really take care of your read. So big shout out to them. Please go and visit them at rejuvenate.com, or you can go over to our website and follow the link over to theirs. Um, if you're looking for a better way to store your reads and you're looking for something that's just going to make them perform fantastically at all times, this is the way to do it. Not to mention it's going to save you a ton of money by making your reads last longer. So go and check them out, rejuvenate.com. All right, so today on the podcast, as I said, we have Nick Finzer, an awesome trombone player, lives in New York City, is uh, doing a whole bunch of things performing-wise, and happens to run one of the coolest record labels on the scene today, uh, full of young musicians uh, from all over the country, not just in New York, and just doing some really, really big things, bringing you great music. He also has an awesome podcast, the Outside In Music Podcast, for all, I know all of you guys out there are avid po podcast listeners, so add this one to your list, the Outside In Music Podcast. He's got a YouTube channel, he is absolutely all over the place, doing everything that you can imagine, and I, I just highly recommend that you check out everything that he's putting out. So, without further ado, please help me welcome Nick Finzer onto the podcast. It's my pleasure to welcome onto the podcast Nick Finzer. Thanks for coming on, man. Yeah, thanks for having me. Maybe we could start by getting a little bit of your backstory. Uh, you know, where are you from? How did you get into music? And how did you find yourself where you are today? Sure. Yeah, I grew up in Rochester, New York, you know, fabulous upstate New York. And I kind of fell into music. Um, through, I didn't always play trombone. I kind of started music through singing and, uh, in elementary school choir and, and middle school choir and all of that sort of thing. And thought I wanted to be a singer. And I started taking voice lessons at the Eastman school of music, uh, community division, which is, uh, also in Rochester. And through there, I got introduced to, uh, a, a person that had moved to town uh, that started a jazz big band and they knew they needed a trombone player and they knew I was taking lessons and happened to also play trombone and we were uh, gearing up for the essentially Ellington competition uh, with that and that introduced me to the music of Duke Ellington and kind of the rest was history I kind of went changed everything that I wanted to do kind of got really serious about trombone starting ninth tenth grade and then uh, ended up going into school for music um, whoa Sorry about that. And I, uh, I, I, st I got to meet a, a very important person eventually in my life, which who was Wycliffe Gordon, and he came through Rochester to do just a concert, and uh, he ended up being willing to give me a couple of lessons, and I used to drive down to New York to get a few lessons, and I really wanted, I had my heart set on going to Juilliard for jazz, and um, that didn't work out at that time, and so I ended up sticking in Rochester and going to the Eastman School of Music and doing some of my studies there. And at that time, my parents left Rochester and kind of abandoned me there and headed out to Arizona. And so I stayed and kind of had to fend for myself, which has ended up being a good thing, I think, because it forced me into doing a lot of projects and being able to handle a lot of things at once, which has kind of translated well into everything that I'm doing now. Uh, fast forward after that, I, ended up, I did end up getting into Juilliard, moving down to New York, and um, now I'm here and playing and teaching and doing all kinds of stuff. That's awesome, man. I guess it's pretty cool that uh, your backup school was Eastman. You know, I mean, that's not a, a bad thing to end up there. Yeah, I mean, when you grow up there, it kind of is like always there and you don't think right. of it. If you kind of take it for granted, but it's a uh, you know a great school, and I was I was pretty lucky that that was the case. Now, did you frequent going to New York City? I know that's a long trip. How long of a trip is it from Rochester to the city? It's about three hundred and fifty miles, so you know about five and a half six hours. 
Did you did you try uh, to get down there as much as you could while you were going to Eastman? Or? You know, not really. I yeah. mean, I guess that's a tough thing. But I mean, sometimes, like at least every couple of months, but not as much as maybe you would think. <laughs> so uh, another thing that I really wanted to talk to you about today is your record label, um, Outside In Music. Um, mm-hmm. And, you know, it's obviously a really tough business, especially these days, the record business, and not to mention running a jazz record label. So what made you want to do this and uh, what what keeps you going with your record label? Yeah, so I like to think of it not just as a record label, but kind of as a media company and cool. that we make, you know, more than just records. And so, like you mentioned, we have you know some podcasts and we're kind of venturing out into some other you know, video content coming up this year in 2018. So uh, we're doing some, some other things, trying to provide more of a 360 experience for our artists. So it's not just like, here's the, here's the record and that's the end of it. So for me, that's just the beginning of it. And I'm trying to take advantage of, you know, all of the media that's available to us. Um, the, the reason that I started it was because, uh, when I was finishing up my master's degree, I, looked at my calendar and I didn't see anything and I knew that I wanted to have some opportunities to play my music. Mm -hmm. And so I really quickly got my band together. We had played a few gigs, but we uh, got together in the couple days between um, graduation, like the end of school and graduation, (laughs) got in the studio and made a record. And then I started shopping it around and everyone wanted to take 18 months to put it out or they didn't want it or any, any and all of those situations. So I said, you know what, let me learn how to do this myself. It's my first record. I might as well, you know, find out how this works. And so I kind of went through the process of hiring publicists and finding out about that side of things. And so in the process, I needed a name for the label for it to come out. So I, I came up with the name uh, for Outside in Music. And so I just thought it would be for this one record. And then I ended up uh, doing some other projects and realizing that I did know kind of what I was doing just as much as anyone else and that I could help my friends and everyone else that maybe doesn't care about learning about that stuff. Yeah, and yeah. I, you know, it, I've already done it. So it takes me two minutes where it might take them two hours to learn about it. So I'm like, well, I might as well just do it right. and uh, help people out. And so now it's grown little by little and uh, has become, you know, doing 15 releases in 2017. Wow. So trying to see if we can up the game from there, but that's a pretty high number. So we'll see, we'll see what happens this year. Right. That's a lot, man. That's great though. Um, that was, you, you touched on something else that I was going to ask you about, you know, finding artists for your record label. Uh, when you first started out, was it mostly, I mean, I know that a lot of the guys and gals that put out records on your label, like you might actually be playing in their ensemble or clearly they're, they're friends of yours. Uh, after listening to your podcast and hearing you interview a lot of your artists, it's clear that you guys have known each other for a long time. Um, sure. Did it start out that way? Just like, I want to be able to put out my my friends and bandmates' music because you loved it so much? Yeah, I mean, I guess, it, it, like I said, like a lot of people I knew were trying to get their music out there, or I felt like their music needed to get out there, and they weren't taking the steps. So, you know, a couple of people I've pushed along the way, like, Hey, you need to do this. Hey, you need to do this. Um, but I mean, what some of the, I, sorry, I'm looking up at all the releases I have. I'm going <laughs> to nice. hear after I'm like, who is the first one? Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, the first person that I really pushed was, you know, a friend for a long time, a pianist, his name was Chris Ziemba. Mm-hmm. And he, uh, really always, he needed to make a record. And so I had to kind of push him to do it. And we had been playing for years and he had played on some other projects of mine. And then other people were like, Oh, I just run in the studio. I'm just going to put up these videos. I'm like, Hey, you, you've got music. Let's put it out. You know, I can help you do that. And so it started out with friends and then they kind of recommended some people. And now some people get in touch with me kind of out of the blue, which is great. You know, I love to see what people are doing and, um, try to fit them into to our release schedule if, if I can. But a lot of it is, kind of New York centric. Uh, some of it is Eastman people that have reached out to me and what they might be in various places around. Um, but you know, it's always about to me, just someone that has a unique vision and is trying to execute it. What, you know, whether it's like super straight ahead or kind of more Mm avant-garde to me is less the point, uh, is more that they're doing their own thing, you know, and doing it well. Well, that's really, uh, 
it just seems when I listen to some of your releases that it's very organic that way. You know, you're not trying to, to force anybody into it or um, everybody seems to be really happy on your label, which I think comes through in the music. Um, so I have a question about of you being kind of a, for lack of a better term, somebody who's kind of an industry insider, like running a record label uh, from the ground up. What do you see as like the landscape these days? I mean, do you guys see most of your listens coming from digital streaming services? How are the physical copy sales? I mean, where's kind of the, the future that you see this record business going, at least with jazz? Uh, I think that uh, I think most of the, most of the listens are on YouTube and on Spotify. Just, you know, that's that's it. And so if you're not there, you don't live there. You kind of don't exist right. to the next generation for sure. You know, and um, physical copies will always, I think, be less of a listening tool and more of a, a memory kind of thing. Like it's more of an experience like I want to remember this gig. And so I'll have this person sign the record. And, and so, um, I think that's where you sell them. I don't think people are selling tens of thousands of copies of CDs anymore. You know, laptops don't even have CD players. Cars don't come with CD players. So we all, as we know, we kind of have to adapt and move into a, a new, you know, a new mode of releasing music. But I think, you know, the industry as a whole, like the industry side, anyway, the, they, you know, they want the hard copies. It's kind of a, not not a gatekeeper, but kind of like a stamp that you're serious about what you're doing. That's a certain level of barrier to entry of an investment, um, and to to get the radio play, to get the you know, downbeat reviews, all those kinds of things. They want to still have something that they can hold and look at, uh, and have a you know a record of not just not just the streaming. So I think we're still at a point where we still have to print CDs. And we still have to. Uh, try to use them. I don't know that everyone's going to buy them, but I think it's an important part of putting out a record still. Yeah, it's interesting. It's almost like a CD is like a souvenir from a show. I mean, speaking yeah. from from my own personal experience, that's one of the few times that I actually buy physical copies unless I'm in a record store and I see something I like. It's like you want to bring home that experience with you and a CD is a great way to do that. So super interesting to hear that from somebody who deals with it on a daily basis. Um, so I guess my next question would be the, the playing, the balance thing. I know you do a ton of playing and you're really, really active on the New York scene as a player. Uh, how do you balance all of it? And the reason that I kind of ask this question is I think a lot of the listeners to this podcast are people that, um, want to get better at jazz, but also have a full-time job and are trying to sort of fit everything together and still put out really high quality music themselves. So what is it like balancing, you know, a life as a performer, which can take up all your time and a life as running a record label and a media company, how do you fit it all together? Um, I don't know. <laughs> no, I, mean, I think that it's, I, I have to be a very organized person. You know, I have lots of uh, planners and lists, to-do lists and all of these kinds of things. But uh, for me, I'm still a performer first. Uh, I'm still a musician first. Um, the record label thing is, uh, you know, kind of a, you know, a side thing, for lack of a better word. You know, it's, it's, a, it's a labor of love. It's trying to help people get their music out. And so sometimes it's really busy and I have, a lot of things to do for that. And other times, um, I try to, you know, have some time away from it. So I, what I like to do is kind of, you know, batch tasks together and record maybe, you know, eight, 10 podcasts in a day, or maybe record eight or 10 videos in a day rather than, you know, spread them out and do one, even though the content's coming out every week, sometimes, you know, try to load it up and then let it come out and kind of repeat those cycles. And for me, um, posing the question to myself, you know, what would this look like if it were easy right. and trying to, you know, steal advice like that from various, you know, people that I follow on the internet and just kind of make sure that I'm not overcomplicating things. Mm -hmm. So uh, I have a tendency to do that. So I'm, I keep trying to simplify and simplify and simplify and find a way to make it all work. Um, you know, I've been lucky that I've had lots of performance opportunities and that has allowed me extra time to, you know, not only just work on music stuff, but to be able to have time to develop a label and, and all of that sort of thing. I haven't, you know, 
than having a full-time gig or something that wasn't flexible enough for me to be able to figure out how to squeeze this stuff in too. So um, I guess it goes in cycles uh, and I have to always just kind of plan out where things are going. And I think now after being imbalanced for about you know a year or two, I'm slowly starting to correct the ship <laughs> and, see, and kind of see how this goes hand in hand. Yeah. Now, have you always been kind of uh, entrepreneurial minded since you were younger or um, is was there inspiration from that side of things? Like you were mentioning some of the people that you follow on the Internet. Um, is that for, you know, kind of inspiration on the business side of things as well as the music side of things? Is there anybody that you pay attention to in that that world? Yeah, sure. I mean, I, I guess I don't know if I was always entrepreneurial, but I've always been a person that's kind of impatient. And so I've kind of, uh, I've always had bands and I've always, you know, been making records and trying to find a way to make a life in music. And I kind of, I'm unwilling to accept the stereotypes that people, mm -hmm. um, talk about, you know, in turn, I don't think that it's mutually exclusive that, you know, artists have to be, uh, you know, monks, you know, that right. you don't have to be, you can, you can do what you want. And that's what I think. And so, yeah, there's some people I follow on the internet, like, the the, e the keeping things easy thing comes from Tim Ferriss, mm -hmm. you know, and then uh, I also been following uh, Gary Vaynerchuk online. Yeah. You know, my dad when I was growing up turned me on to Tony Robbins when I was in middle school, and I hated it at the time. I thought it was <laughs> dumb, and um, but over time you kind of grow into things. And you know, my dad is a businessman. He uh, he's more of an executive and he's done that. And he never really talked to me about any of that kind of thing. I think, I guess as I grown up, everyone says that I'm very similar to my dad. Mm -hmm. So I guess I have that him to blame, but I, it was never something that he tried to pass on. It was just something that I guess I observed his hard work all the time and just thought that was normal, I guess. And even though maybe I gave him a hard time when I was a kid now, uh, now he gives me a hard time on vacation when I'm, like working and right. he's relaxing and he's like, I, you gave me a hard time. We're all growing up and now you're the only one working here. And so, uh, I guess, I guess that's kind of where it comes from, but you know, I, I guess I've always been entrepreneurial. I wish I could just play and not do any of the other stuff, but it always kind of crops up in the back of my mind. Like we could do this better or why don't we just do it this way? Or just, I guess I can't turn off the, that idea side of my brain very well. So it just, I've just tried to learn to embrace it and just kind of go with it. Yeah, and also it's it's kind of the other stuff that you're thinking about and doing that allows you to, you know, just do music. Maybe it's not playing all the time, but but you're dealing with music from the time you wake up to the time you go to bed. I mean, that's that's pretty good, you know. Yeah, no, it's great. Cool. So I'm going to throw you uh, five questions that I ask everybody who comes on to the show. And uh, the first one is, what is one educational material that you feel like you couldn't live without? material and like a book uh it could be anything um you know a video books whatever what what's one thing that you find yourself coming back to all the time it's my favorite recordings and i i don't really like to be honest much educational books and, and or or any of those kind type of things or instructional videos even though that's something that i uh think is important and i do myself but i think it's the your favorite recordings mm -hmm. when it, when you get kind of down or kind of sidetracked or get have lack of inspiration and I think going back to those favorite recordings and just playing along with them and re-remembering why you got into it in the first place is has been the most uh invaluable to me and so there's a couple recordings like Chikri is now he sings now he sobs for me I just put that on I'm like oh yeah yeah this is the thing this like creative energy and all of that thing serves to inspire me and get me back on track when I need when I need it awesome uh number two who is the teacher that made the biggest impact on you and why uh, his name is Mark Kellogg. He is the jazz trombone and trombone professor at Eastman. I was studying with him when I was in high school. And he had a way of challenging you without you knowing that you were being challenged. And he held you accountable uh, across the board, uh, whether you wanted to play orchestral music or, or not. He would make you do it and do it at very as the highest level he could imagine that you could do it. And and it was just like, I never realized how much it made me improve until later and how thankful I was that he did that for me and for all of his students. 
uh, even though maybe when you're 18 and you go studying for jazz, you don't want to be working on Mahler or, you know, whatever it was, it was invaluable. And so I, you know, had the opportunity to work with him when I was in high school and in college. So it was a long lasting relationship and he's been a great mentor and very helpful after, uh, you know, as a sounding board to learn about teaching at the college level and you know, a bunch of other things that he's been willing to share his experience with me with. But, uh, yeah, he's, kind of an unsung hero, I think, in the in the trombone world, for sure. That's awesome. I always love to, to hear that answer from people because it's so illuminating to kind of where they are now. So next one would be, what is one thing that you make every single one of your students work on without exception? Practicing slow. Okay. Uh, practicing slower than you think is slow. And uh, that's because that was instilled in me by my teacher and my master, Steve Ture. It was like practice slow, and I was like, I am practicing slow. It's like no, it's not slow enough because this once you really slow it down, then you can actually hear all of the components that are making you not perform it correctly when you get up to speed. And just focusing in on the details, being able to hear the quality of your sound, the quality quality of your articulation at those slow tempos, and actually dealing with yourself sounding really bad. You know, and you can't do it until you slow it so far down. Um, that you can't uh, you can't ignore it anymore. So to me, that was probably the you know one of the biggest pieces of advice that I received from him for sure. But that's that's something I tell all my students, and they don't believe me for a while until they realize, oh yeah, slow like forty, not like right. sixty. And I can't tell you how happy I am to hear you say that because I literally <laughs> say it on every episode that I put out, um, and and I come across that with my students too. You say slow. They, they think slow for about five seconds and then they're playing it fast again. Um, but it is, it's huge. So very glad to hear you say that. Uh, next question would be, what is the one personal quality or characteristic that you feel makes people successful in music? Oh, that's a, that's a good question. Um, I think, and it also depends how you define success, I guess. Mm -hmm. But I guess the one quality is, uh, uniqueness i think uh the people that at least that i associate with and who i consider the most successful are the ones who have you know a vision and they kind of go for it whether it's you know their own original music or reinterpreting somebody else's music uh them finding a way to stand out because there's so many people trying to do what we do whether we're talking about jazz or just music in general and in order to have something interesting to say you have to have a unique you know point of view and i think everyone does but people not everyone embraces the reality that they need to you know go inside themselves and find that thing find, nobody needs to hear you know another copycat of michael brecker or another copycat of freddie hubbard or jj johnson or whatever and people want to hear you know through that lens, your experience and your sound and your point of view. And so I think that, that most of the people that I can think of that I would consider successful definitely have their own you know, unique viewpoint on music, even if maybe you don't hear it right away, but as you spend more time with them, you, you know, understand that they do have a unique way of thinking about it, even though it's definitely connected to the history of the music. And, uh, and so, and so I think that uniqueness is probably probably one of the best qualities to go after. Any advice on like, you know, finding the, the courage to let your uniqueness come through? Because I know a lot of, I know a lot of personally, a lot of students and musicians that I think have amazing things to say, but they just have trouble, even myself sometimes have trouble, you know, feeling that that uniqueness is valid, you know, almost that kind of thing. Yeah, I mean... It's taken me at least a, a long time to kind of come around to it as well. I think, you know, it's part of growing up and part of, part of you know, having experience. And that's why guys with experience always have, you know, this deeper wisdom. But, right. you know, for me, I had a long time when I was in college where I always thought, what, I sh what, what should I be playing? You know, should I sound like this or should I sound like this? You know, and I was trying to appease everyone that I played for. And in a certain way, it was great because it allowed me to play a certain way for some, this teacher and a certain way for that teacher and get better at playing a lot of different styles and playing a lot of different like 
I guess to me, like concepts, like maybe an Ellington concept or, or maybe a more modern concept or not playing in a modern concept. Um, so trying to get rid of the word should, I guess, mm-hmm. out of vocabulary, mm-hmm. like, uh, you should sound however you want to sound, you know, uh, but thinking you should play one way instead of another way. And then, um, getting up the courage, you know, I think you just have to take the leap. Uh, and I, I tell this to myself all the time and, and this is about projects. This is about music. Just like if, you know, if somebody gives you a hard time about it or, or they don't like it or whatever, you know, I just remind myself it's not for them. Right. You know, this is for, uh, the people that do appreciate it, you know, and, um, you just kind of have to build up a thick skin, I guess, moving to New York, you know, in a certain kind of way, kind of help to build up that part of me, you know, right. that trying to do, just deal with people on an everyday level, let alone on a musical level. But that telling myself that that's how I, you know, keep myself moving and, and it's like, OK, well, you know what? It's not for him or it's not for her. Cool. And then uh, the last question is kind of a more tactile thing. What's the best musical purchase under or around a hundred dollars that you've made in the past year? You recognize this from Tim Ferriss. <laughs> I was going to say, oh, somebody's been listening to Tim Ferriss. A uh, hundred dollars, musically speaking, that's been the best purchase. Uh, let me think. Oh, I know. It's the like a like a moleskin notebook that's yep. full of music paper. Mm-hmm. It was uh, it was only twenty bucks. Wow. And I found. For some reason, I always had like just loose leaf uh, music paper, but having it all kind of together in one little spot has allowed me to work faster and find all this, all my musical ideas and not have them just sit unnamed in the voice memo section of my <laughs> cell phone. And so they actually move on to actual music paper. I'm a big proponent of, you know, using technology, but then also staying connected to it via, you know, paper and not writing straight into the computer and kind of making sure to have that tactile feedback and, you know, working on real instruments and hearing the vibrations. I guess I'm kind of old school in that way, Mm -hmm. I guess. But, um, but yeah, so I would say, you know, having a notebook for my music stuff, I've always had notebooks for other things, but I never had for some reason a notebook music, musical ideas. And so that's been, that's been a good one. Well, thanks so much, Nick. This has been an awesome interview and I just want to thank you for taking the time to talk to us. Of course, yeah. Thanks, Nick. Appreciate you having me. So there you have it, our interview with Nick Finzer, a fantastic, fantastic musician and a really good businessman. I mean, it's uh, it's very rare that we come across somebody who is so good at music and uh, has their life together so much as Nick does. So again, go and check out all the stuff. We will be including links in the show notes to Outside in Music, to Nick Finzer's website, uh, to his recordings, everything that's going on in his life will be in the show notes. So go and check it out, and uh, you definitely won't be sorry. Check out some of those releases. One that I would really recommend is Lucas Pino's newest release. He's a really, really great tenor saxophone player. Nick is actually in his band, and his latest release is on Outside in Music. It's called The Answer is No. Uh, That's one that I highly recommend that I have been listening to a ton lately and have been just getting so much out of it. So thanks a lot to Nick for coming on the show. Thanks to Rejuvenate for making this show possible. And thanks to all of you out there listening uh, for tuning into the podcast. We'll see you on Friday with another episode. Talk to you soon. Bye.